Welcome, all of you, to this uh, lecture. Looking yeah. forward to it. And uh, as you know, or you may not know, it's being hosted by 21st Century China Center at uh, UC San Diego, uh, the School of uh, Global Policy and Strategy. Uh, as you may know, GPS is a professional school devoted to the study of international affairs, public policy, and economics. Uh, today's lecture is a hybrid lecture, so we have audience in the room here, and we also have audience on Zoom. And later, there'll be an opportunity for questions. Uh, there'll be live questions from the live audience for people who are attending via Zoom. You will not be voicing your questions, you'll be writing them up, uh, and then we will notice them as they come in and make an effort to get as many of those in as possible. So uh, by way of self-introduction, my name is Paul Pickowitz. I'm a professor emeritus of history and Chinese studies at UC San Diego. Um, and I want to say a couple of words about our speaker. Uh, I'm so glad to be here today to reunite with Joseph Ho, uh, one of my former undergraduate students at UC San Diego. I'm guessing that Joseph graduated with a BA in history at around 2008, nine, 2009, okay. uh, and then he went on to do many, many, many wonderful things. Uh, he is currently assistant professor of history at Albion College in Michigan and uh, an associate at the Center for Chinese Studies at the University of Michigan, uh, which is one of the great centers for Chinese studies in this country. Uh, his research concerns transnational visual culture in Sino-U.S. encounters and modern East Asian history. He is the co-editor of War and Occupation in China, the Letters of an American Missionary from Hangzhou, 1937 to 1938. And of course, he is the author of the book we'll be talking about today, Developing Mission, uh, Photography, Filmmaking, and American Missionaries in Modern China. Here's the book, great cover. Uh, I'll leave it up on the table there later. If people want to grab a hold of it and thumb through. Uh, so congratulations to Joe. Uh, your book investigates the visual practices of American Protestant and Catholic missionaries in modern China as a broad historical phenomenon. Uh, it covers the interwar period, it covers the wartime period, the Civil War period, and the early years of the PRC. Very impressive. To research this book, uh, Joe discovered and assembled a large body of previously unexplored photographs, films, uh, documents, and oral histories in institutional and private collections across the US and East Asia. So we're looking forward to you uh, telling us all about uh, the book. Uh, first, I just wanna mention the lecture is being recorded. Uh, we will have some time for questions after uh, Joe's uh, presentation, which will last about 35 minutes or so. Uh, so if you're participating virtually, use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. We welcome them. Um, and we'll be curating the questions and consolidating them for Joseph to answer during the Q&A time at the end of the talk. So let me turn it over to uh, Professor Joseph O, who will have the next 35, 40 minutes, Max, to talk about his wonderful book. Well, Professor Hall. So much, Professor Pickowitz, for that very kind introduction. And I also wanted to thank the leadership and the staff at the 21st Century China Center for the, the time and the opportunity to speak to you all today. And of course, thank you for being here. And those of you who are uh, watching online or virtually, uh, thank you so much for being here today. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts and comments and questions uh, as we go on. So today, I'll be kind of giving you a snapshot, unintended, view of my book uh, from multiple angles, and also giving you a sense of what it meant for American missionaries in China to make and think about and live in a world inhabited by images. And just to start us off, um, we've got some, I'm gonna kind of, you know, uh, let's see here. Um, certainly this is coming from my most recent book, 
uh, Developing Mission, which is published by Cornell University Press in 2021. Um, the, the, the kinds of stories and ideas I'll be covering today come from all different parts of this book and also other new work that I'm doing that extends beyond developing the mission. But the ideas that I'm covering today, the kinds of core issues and this is for the students listening out there and all of your students also thinking about the different themes that are involved in how we might think about imaging and visual practices by American missionaries. And we have this idea that Photography and filmmaking by American missionaries and Chinese individuals are mediations of transnational modernities in the 20th century. And you think about the word mediate and mediator, these ways of making images and these materials bridge time and space, they bridge communities, they bridge imagination, and they also connect people over time. Uh, both those in China of the period that we're thinking about and today. So in a way, this mediation is continuing right now in this room. And as I think about photography and filmmaking, these are not professionals. I call this vernacular filmmaking, these are vernacular photography. These are not people who are paid to make images or made them as a living or part of their professional life. They made them as part of everyday experience. And that says something about these images. It says something about these cross-cultural encounters. And in terms of this experience, I like to call it missionary modernity and in-betweenness. These missionaries are existing between worlds. In China, they're seen as foreigners. And in the United States, they're seen as representatives of China or their experience there. And in many ways, they're promoting what I call missionary modernity which is kind of exists between the spaces of national modernity, international or global forms of modern uh, experience, and it connects local perceptions and Christian internationalism, which is the sense of Christians being called out into the world to do more than just promote one's religion, but to exist within a modern society in a cosmopolitan and culture across the way. And in this kind of mix, we have visual technologies, the devices that are involved that embody historical meanings that change over time. The materials, the photographs, the film, they move through space and time and they have diverse afterlives. What happens to these images after changes the way that we will consider this history and how the people within this history thought of themselves and their own future. And finally, in these technologies and these ways of thinking, we have ground level experiences, everyday, vernacular, non-professional of American and Chinese communities across national and global Sino-US encounters. And these that cover religious encounters, political encounters, cross-cultural encounters, and images and image making are fundamentally part of how these experiences come to be. Now, in terms of the cast of characters, we have uh, I'm just going to put them up on the, on the screen here. Uh, a number of people that show up first in the book and of course in the materials that we'll be looking at today. And I'm very happy to share that the granddaughter of Harold Henke and Jesse Lee Henke is here with us today. Maria Henke is there. And Mr. Henke and the Henke family, uh, I believe, are watching online this very moment. So I wanted to thank you all, um, but I will get to more of the story of the Hanky family and their images in just a moment. And this is a kind of mixed cast of characters. And this is certainly not the only set of people who were making images at this time, but kind of, again, snapshots of these groups and individuals who were influential in producing the images and experiences that uh, we're going to cover for today. Now, where do we start? We have to start with devices. Because we, in this missionary world, of the 20th century, we have new devices doing new things. We have photography and filmmaking on an ever more affordable basis, a more widespread basis. And this is driven by wide commercialism and the production of consumer technologies in still photography and filmmaking that enable missionaries in China to make their images. And we, uh, on the screen here, we have um, advertisements from a Chinese missionary magazine, a Chinese reporter. If you were to turn to that magazine, if you were a missionary in Shanghai or somewhere else in China and subscribe to this magazine, turn it back, 
in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, you would see uh, images that and advertisements for cameras. And you would be kind of living in a world where you thought about cameras and image making technology. This is overlapping with um, Chinese elites um, who are also depicting cameras, in this case, in a movie magazine, as symbols of urban cosmopolitanism. And cameras are so much faster, so much smaller at this time. Um, in fact, just kind of you know, illustrate my point, I brought one of those cameras here today. So we actually have a 1934 Zeiss Icon camera that um, is very similar to what you see here in this kind of size of an iPhone. I always look at camera salesmen when I do this, but the camera is open. It's very small. You can kind of pass this around and then you fit this in your pocket and just kind of give a sense of how the technology is changing. You think about older forms of image making, big cameras, you sit very still, which is why our ancestors look so upset because they're standing still for this long exposure. To give a sense of what this is changing in this time period, let's do a quick exercise. So when I say come from three, two, one, I, when you hear one, I want you to clap. Let's practice that. Three, two, one. Hit again. Three, two, one. Hit the time it took for you to hear the word one, and for your neurons to fire, and for your hands to actually clap was 0 0.17 seconds. And in the 1920s, Camera shutters, like that camera show today, were firing 10 to 40 times faster than that, which then allowed people like the Hankies to make their first images of China from the deck of a moving ship arriving in Tianjin in October of 1927. Harold Hankey and Jesse May Hankey unfolded their holding camera and pointed it out, and set that high shutter speed, and froze in motion the view of what they would then later call the land of our adoption. And this technology and its mobility enable people like the Hankies in their first year of language training in Beijing to roam the city, uh, photographing, producing images on the street, candid photographs in ways that allow them to kind of blend into the background. And this technology shaped the ways that they engaged with people and places around them. And you, you just imagine when you take pictures in a new area, in a new place, what do you do? You scope out the area, you try to practice your rudimentary language skills, you are practicing cultural engagement and awareness. And that is what the Hankies are doing as they enter China. And they have one year of uh, almost over one year of language training in Beijing before they go on to their mission station, a Presbyterian mission, about 250 miles south of Beijing. And their camera goes with them as they start to be embedded in this new environment. Um, when they arrive at their mission station, there is Dr. Harold Henke there. Um, they begin making photographs with that same camera of their medical work, of religious activities. And this is all part of becoming embedded with a community and also representing it in images that are on the ground, vernacular, every day. And I also realized that the Hankies were thinking about technology as they were making these images because they knew there was no way their cameras could capture color. So a number of their photographs, they had hand painted with colors and sent back to the United States as a way of capturing reality um, because they knew that there were limitations to even the kinds of mobile technologies that they had and they enhanced them in some ways by photo processing and other ways of kind of extending their technological reach. The Hankies I will return to later on in this uh, talk and I'm happy to answer questions of course um, but we also have, the Hankies are not the only group uh, in China making images in a modern way. And when I look at this image, which is from a Catholic order, the Passionists, who were very active uh, in Wuhan and also in Hanpo uh, and in uh, Hunan in various parts of the 1920s through 1950s, this is the epitome of what I think of as a modern missionary, a priest with a typewriter and a typewriter for communication an alarm clock, which is regimenting time, telling you what time it is, you keep track to your schedule with that alarm clock. And if you zoom in on this picture and flip it upside down, Kodak film, rolls of Kodak film that this missionary has just unloaded in that photograph, I believe, is the first photo that he took on this roll of film. It's a selfie. 
It's the selfie of a modern missionary with all the tools of his trade, testing out the fact that I'm going to make this first photo and we'll see how it turns out. What he's doing with his right hand is squeezing a trigger that will activate the shutter on his camera to make this selfie of this very modern missionary. But these images go places. They don't stay in China, they move. They go from place to place and for the passionists, for the images that they made, they were sent to another place, not in West Hunan, but sent to West Hoboken, New Jersey, in the 1920s and 30s, where they were edited and reproduced for the in-house church magazine, The Sign. And this is where images begin to enter new worlds of circulation. They are absorbed by congregations in the United States. They're edited. They're reframed. In some cases, that's actually the, the white marks or cropping marks to erase the background because it's distracting. And there are negotiations between people who are in China and people who are in the United States about how to interpret these images. And those negotiations don't always happen in one direction. And they're not always accurate from the missionary point of view. For example, we've got this image, which was published with a article by the Passionists depicting a famine in China in the mid 1920s. And in the image that finally made it out in the magazine, you have this title, Yao Fai, right? We begging, we need food, a cry of distress. But in the original image, which depicts not only the emaciated bodies of the father and son, and the Passionist priest, you have a tree that's full of fruit right behind them, persimmon-like fruit. And when that image got to West Hoboken, New Jersey, the editor took it out because it was kind of inconvenient to depict a famine when there's a readily available food source directly behind the starving people that you are attempting to portray. And guess what? When the missionaries received the final copy of this magazine when it was mailed back to them with that final image, they were very upset. They wrote back to the editor saying, you have destroyed our image. You have in fact lied to the public about our reality. You have even made the priest look thinner than he actually is. <laughs> what you have done is a sin. You have manipulated images to get money from congregations and this will not stand. So there's a push-pull between the makers of the images and the recipients of the images that is, in effect, a negotiation between realities in China and realities in the United States, or interpretations of the, in the United States. But as we move along in this history, uh, switching over here to another uh, person, a colleague of the Hanke family, Dr. Ralph Lewis, who himself goes to China in the 1930s with an advanced camera. And this camera, in fact, I have also brought here today, the twin lens reflex uh, Roloflex camera. And he makes hundreds of images, again, using that technology of the roll film, which is also taking more and more photographs. It is small, it is mobile, and it is this kind of camera that, as you kind of see this posture, what Dr. Lewis looks like when he's making this image is not the kind of posture you will think of when you actually take photographs. Most people, when we take photographs, you're pointing at people, right? iPhone points, big camera points. Dr. Lewis is actually doing this. How is that up to you? I am bowing to you. And there's this kind of submissive posture that is governed by the technologies, governed by the camera, that essentially changes the way that people engage with the photographer and how the photographer is existing in this environment. And Dr. Lewis went on to make images of indigenous Chinese communities, of churches that they were self-called self-supporting churches that only received a portion of their funding from the United States, but otherwise it was self-driven, self-funded, self-organized. And these are indigenous Chinese Christian communities that are also being imaged with technologies that require the missionary to present a submissive posture to the people in front of the lens. In this case, this right-hand side image is actually of a memorial service that took place in a church in uh, uh, Hunan. Um, and it's a memorial service that has at its heart a photograph of a missionary that is not there. This is a man, a missionary, who was serving that church who died in Oklahoma after a car accident. And the news was telegraphed back to China, modern technology, 
and to take the place of his body, a photograph was substituted such that the missionary was almost there in kind of some kind of photographic reality. But the whole organization, the memorial service, was put together by Chinese Christians, not by missionaries. This is an indigenous Chinese Christian community using modern technology to commemorate one of their beloved colleagues who had died thousands of miles away. And to kind of think about, again, moving along with the connections between worlds, between places, and between technologies, I'd like us to look at this photograph. And um, when I look at this photograph, this is a American Presbyterian regional meeting in the early 1930s, uh, which also Ben May comes from the Hanke family collection. What stands out to me is not necessarily a group of people, but a certain box that Dr. Hanke is carrying. That box, look at it, and you're like, where did that come from? Where did that box come from? Well, it didn't come from China, and neither was it really truly a box. It was something that actually originated in New York, in city in Rye, the Rye Presbyterian Church, before Christmas of 1930, at a prayer meeting. At the prayer meeting, they resolved that the offering taken during the service will be used for the purpose purchasing a moving picture camera for Dr. Henke to use in China. And once you see that box, you cannot unsee the box because it starts showing up in family photographs of the Henke family. Harold, Robert, Richard, who he is listening today on Zoom, and Jesse May Henke, and behind them on the ledge is the 16 millimeter Cinecoda movie camera that then went on to produce over the Kenki's tenure in China, and they were there until 1949, they shot 6,400 feet of movie film using this camera that had been shipped to them by a church in Rye, New York, and then joined their family history. And when I graduated from the University of Michigan with my PhD in 2017, the Henke family very generously gifted me that camera with the stipulation or the request that I always use it in teaching. And here we are. And I don't have the camera with me today, but I'm happy to be able to tell its story. And that camera made movie film. It made film that bridged the worlds of modern missions. Missions that involved humanitarian work, saving bodies and healing wounds, as well as spiritual work, saving souls, and this was very much a part of the missionary modernity of time that always had to navigate criticism from churches abroad. Are you doing enough to save people's souls? Are you doing enough to help people's bodies? And there were two different de debates that were going on in the United States at that time. The fundamentalists who said, you are not preaching Christianity enough. And the modernists who said, you are not doing enough humanitarian work. And the films bridge that you literally have reels of film that say hospital, healing bodies. You literally have reels of film that say church, saving souls. And those two things are inseparable in the modern missionary enterprise. And it is this camera that begins to document the new Chinese Christian communities that are arising during this time. Communities that invert gender roles. Women who go out to lead Bible studies, women who go out to take medicine, to their communities. And this one screenshot from this uh, part of the films that the Hankies made, these women are gathering together to pray, to talk about their faith, and in the background, men are serving the food. It's an inversion of gender roles in ways that perhaps were not expected for this time. And to add on to that, the camera doesn't stay in China. When the Hankies go back on furlough to the United States in the 1930s, they make films in the United States to take back to China. And I call this the 16 millimeter bridge. That cameras are being deployed to connect imaginations about the United States with imaginations about China and the hankies in moving between China and the United States. I'm making these films, are connecting these worlds. And I looked at these films from the hankies' time on furlough. They did not film big cities. They did not film things that would have been fully alien to the Chinese audience. Instead, they filmed farms. They were back in the Midwest, 
in their home communities. They filmed circuses. They filmed a mining machine, gravel mining. And they were essentially producing a kind of visual modernity that Chinese audiences would have resonated with. I know that horse looks like my horse. I know that farm looks like my farm. I don't know that machine, but that looks pretty cool. But there are ways of kind of pushing the boundaries of modernity while also maintaining or uh, resolving these connections between worlds that the Hankies are explicitly doing with their filmmaking. Make images that our friends in China will be able to resonate with. And it was thanks to the little boy who was sitting on his mother's lap, Richard Hankey, whom I met in San Diego at the Chinese Historical Museum uh, when I was finishing my undergrad degree. I was first introduced to the Hankey's photographs and film, and the story kind of starts from there. So there's this kind of movement through space and time and connections between communities that again resonates and has so many more repercussions than one can kind of expect. But here we have Dr. Richard Henke screening for the very first time his parents' films for me in summer of 2013 using the old family projector. But to move on here, missionary filmmaking was not just used for religious work and humanitarian work. Rather, when China changed around the mission in the summer of 1937, the Japanese military invaded North China and ignited the Second Sino-Japanese War. When this happened, missionaries were there with cameras. They were there with local awareness. They were there with linguistic abilities to navigate what was before them. And all of a sudden, missionaries with cameras become documenters of war. And we have in this upper right-hand corner, the Reverend John McGee, who produced the only known film footage of the rape of Nanjing or the Nanjing massacre, which I'll not show, but these atrocities enacted by the Japanese military against innocent civilians, um, the deaths of tens or hundreds of thousands of people, depending on the calculations, were filmed in great detail by an American Episcopal missionary who had on his person the ability to make these films using this camera, which I was able to, using the notes and the photographs, reconstruct an exact copy of the camera that was used by the Reverend McGee in Nanji to make his films. And part of the experience of reconstructing this camera was I suddenly understood why it is that the films I'm watching are very shaky. Well, it's very heavy. Also listen to this. This is very loud. And why is the Reverend McGee shaking as he makes these images? Why is he turning the camera on and off as he films Japanese soldiers rounding up civilians from a distance? It's because that thing's very heavy and is very loud. That people can hear and he's trying to disguise his movie making. And that again is something behind the scenes that we don't see because all we see is the final product, not the process. So what I'm trying to do is to combine the process and the product to think about what it meant to be a documenter of war as a missionary who had already been equipped to make these images beforehand. But interestingly enough, when the Reverend McGee produced these images, he wrote up notes. He typed up long notes that went with the descriptions of these films. And it started with this. These pictures have been taken with no thought of stirring up a spirit of revenge against the Japanese. This is Christian internationalism. This was the use of missionary contacts and a way of living in the world that was attempting to not just raise hatred. It was not meant for that. The films that McGee was making was not intended to produce hatred of the Japanese, which of course would happen with the Americans and the Japanese later on in this war, but it was in fact to bridge and to make aware these other audiences that if you just knew how terrible this war was, you would try to stop it. And he has this phrase there, the photographer has been to Japan and he knows how beautiful that country is and have many people are to be found there. If they just knew how terrible the war was, if they just watched these movies, a vast number of them 
would be horrified. And the reason why McGee cannot reconcile the brutality that he's seeing in front of his camera with what he, you know, he has experienced before is that 10 years before Nanjing, 10 years before the massacre, he was in Japan with that same camera, making images, films of his kindergarten age son playing with Japanese children in the spring of 1937. And he had indeed lived in Japan. He could not reconcile that these film images he had made 10 years before were now somehow erased. Somehow the people who were behind this war, the Japanese military, were disconnected from the Japanese people. The Japanese people are noble. We must find a way to stop this war. And if they knew, if they saw these films, they would know. They would know. And there's an echo here of what's happening in 1937 with current day events, great out of the same type of portions. February 24th, 2022, President Zelensky of Ukraine goes on this broadcast and says, Russian TV won't show my broadcast. They won't show what I'm going to say. But if the Russian people knew what is going to happen, they would also try to stop this war before it began. And in 2022, we have an echo of what was for these missionaries in the Second Sino Japanese War Christian internationalism. Stop this war and we will use media and our religious identities to try and stop this conflict. So this bridge is not just between peacetime communities and family and humanitarian work and religious work. It is also an attempt to reach out to the world to stop a global conflict through media and film. Now, to kind of wrap things up a bit, these types of images, of course, do not simply belong to Americans. They do not simply belong to churches or missionary groups. They appear in other places. And in this case, we have a photograph album in Wuhan, 2011, that I was able to discover. And in this photograph album, we have places that you know may seem somewhat familiar to some of us here or some of us listening online. Um, buildings at, of all places, Cornell University. Uh, University published developing mission up in the upper left-hand corner. We have on the bottom left-hand corner workers who are part of the WPA, Works Progress Administration, erecting these types of signal towers or radio towers as part of Depression-era government work in the United States. And then all suddenly on the right-hand side, we have images of wartime China, 1945. We have the Southwest University and other uh, universities that have been moved to the interior of China during the Second Sino-Japanese War. And the person putting these images together is a man named Li Qinghai, who had been educated at Cornell before the war, who had returned to China during the, uh, right before the war, and had then been heavily involved in restaffing and moving his universities into the interior to continue educational work despite the challenges and horrors of the Second Sino Japanese War. And this is his photograph album, but it's not just his album alone. On one page, we start to see photographs of a young woman. And this young woman starts to appear more and more, and we suddenly realize that she's not alone either. She starts to, she appears in at least two photographs with people you have seen earlier in this talk. The Hanky family. The young woman you just saw earlier, Yuju, was once a Chinese refugee during the Second Sino Japanese War. When the war came, her family fled to the Presbyterian Mission compound in Shunta, now called Xintai, in Hebei province. And there she was, um, she decided to join the nurse training school in which the Hankies worked. And the Hanky family and Liu Zhu and her husband Qinghai began a decades long friendship that essentially appeared here and there in images that were kept by Liu Zhu. And in this case, this is 1948 in Beijing, or then called Beijing. And this is her Liu Zhu at her wedding reception, which was held in the house that the Hankies had lived in in the Presbyterian mission in Beijing. And the Hankies have essentially sponsored her marriage 
they supported her marriage, interestingly, to a man who was not Christian, and saying that, well, let's try this out. And in a way, there's again a sense of missionary modernity, extended views of how one might relate to modernity and missions, and to kind of uh, see where these images are going. Left hand side, wedding reception. Right hand side, wedding portrait. That was not in the album, but in fact, in an album thousands of miles away in Rolling Hills, California, that the Hanky family had kept for decades after that. A symbol of their friendship with the Yuchu and the Qinghai. Two sets of photographs on opposite sides of the Pacific that connected a family, two families, that connected time and space. And I was fortunate enough to actually meet Liu Xu in Wuhan in 2011, thanks to contact with Richard Henke, who had kept in touch with Liu Xu and her family. And it was underneath the bed that we're looking at in this photograph here that Liu Xu kept those photographs albums. And from time to time, she would come out and leaf through the albums. And when I met her, she was 94 years old and she was suffering from senile dementia. And she would look at these photographs and suddenly have this flash of recognition, this moment as she recognized people. And she said to me, Dr. Henke and Mrs. Henke, they were like my family. They were people that I loved. There was one photograph that was not there. And I did not find it until later on. When I was back in California, making copy photographs of one of the Henke family scrap I came across this image that was made in 1937 by Ralph Lewis with that twin lens camera that you saw earlier, pasted into the pages of the Hanky family album. And it was the photograph that had been taken the, the, the time that Liu Xu had entered the nurses' training school as a refugee during the Second Sino Japanese War. And that's her front row, left hand side as a young nurse trainee. When I found this photograph, I made a copy of it, a digital copy, and I emailed it to Liu Zhu's son in Wuhan. And he showed it to his mother. And 16 days later, I received a message. My mother has passed away. She was 94 years old. She lived a good life. But when she saw this photograph, suddenly she remembered the names of every single one of her classmates sitting next to her and behind her. And it is this that, again, makes me think about the types of experiences, the multiple histories, the different levels through which these materials pass. And photographic theorist Susan Sontag very famously wrote that all photographs are memento mori, which is Latin for remember that you must die. And I quote, by slicing out this moment, by precisely slicing out this moment of time, photographs testify to time's relentless melt. But I would say there's something else about this, about these materials that bridge time and space and belief and politics and geography, that they are in other ways, memento vivera, Remember that you must live. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. I feel uh, extremely moved because this project started as an undergraduate thesis project right here at UC San Diego. And the fact that you connected with many of these people right here in San Diego, this whole trip coming back to us uh, today with the book, uh, and uh, it's just uh, overwhelming. Uh, so what we wanna do, this is good because we have a, a nice 20 minute period of time to pose questions. I actually, had written down eight questions. I'm only going to ask one of those questions because actually I want to hear your voices. Uh, I want to encourage you to uh, keep your questions brief so that we can get a lot of them in and, and uh, Professor Hope can answer 
uh, those questions briefly and to just get as much momentum going as possible. I'll start off with one question uh, and then we'll do some right here and then we'll rely on Thomas to uh, go to the online uh, audience. If you're online, uh, type in your question uh, in the Q&A section uh, and I hope we'll have time to uh, get to it. So let me start the ball rolling. Wow. Uh, and the book is being passed around so that you can, uh, you know, take a look at it uh, if you haven't already seen it. So my question, because you deal with this uh, in the book itself, um, you make the assertion in the book that you, among many, many other things that you're doing, you are challenging what one might call one-dimensional stereotypes of missionaries and missionary activity in China, uh, not just in the 20th century, but starting early in the 19th century, even earlier than that, uh, that you're trying to, and I think succeeding in challenging uh, one-dimensional stereotypes of missionaries, who they were and what they were up to. Uh, but I'd like to ask you, what are those stereotypes? What do you think those stereotypes are? And this includes uh, official positions in China itself about missionaries, you know, being working hand in glove with imperialists uh, and so on. What are those stereotypes? How would you articulate them? Uh, why do you reject them? And in what ways do you challenge the stereotypes in the book? Uh, uh, and do you anticipate any pushback uh, in, and maybe you've gotten some pushback already, uh, and if so, you know, who are you getting that pushback from? That's my question. Excellent question. Thank you, Paul. So one of the things that uh, I guess we will call a kind of stereotypical view of missionary is something that you just mentioned briefly earlier in your question, is the question of cultural imperialism. The missionaries go to a place to change the culture of people who are there, and often in heavy-handed ways. And this has also been translated into kind of popular culture imaginations of what a missionary actually looks like, especially in a foreign context. We have people coming in with little cultural awareness, essentially carrying Bibles to kind of oppress people or uh, challenge their beliefs or destroy their beliefs in a very heavy-handed and often destructive manner. That's a stereotype. Of course, there were conservative missionaries. Of course, there were ways in which that those types of things took place. But when you look at what missionaries were doing, and I'll let the missionary community speak for itself, there's a 1929 article uh, that was published in the Chinese Reporter, the magazine that I showed the ads from earlier, and it's called The Modern Significance of the Missionary. And in 1929, missionaries from Protestant groups and also in some Catholic groups were already thinking about themselves in relation to primitive missionaries. We are no longer those primitive missionaries. And what are those primitive missionaries? They only belong to one place. They take ideas and beliefs from one area and they impose it on other people, whether they like it or not. But rather, what are we doing now in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s? We are thinking about ways that we are working with rather than over communities on the ground in China. We're thinking about ways that we are collaborators rather than control. We are ways of thinking about how we might think about ourselves in a modern cosmopolitan, internationally connected light. And how do you do that? You do that by changing the way that you practice your religion and ways that you carry out humanitarian work. And you change that in the ways that you portray that type of shift in images and in media. So in many ways, the missionaries are cognizant of them, of their kind of a longer legacy that's problematic in many ways, but then saying that we can still hold on to our beliefs, but change the ways that we express and assist rather than oppress. Great. So let me take some questions now, and I ask you to keep the question brief uh, and speak loudly because we want the mics to pick up your question. Uh, and I'll ask uh, Professor Ho to keep his answers brief so that we can hear as many voices as possible. Sir. How, how were the missionaries received by the Chinese people? How did they, what, what were their view of the missionaries? That's a good, great question. So certainly it depended on who you were in the Chinese community. Certainly there was a sense at first with different missionaries entering areas and a sense of alienation. 
the Hankies write in their memoirs, they were called foreign devils on multiple occasions. And this is again part of the stereotype from the Chinese side, uh, that perspective. But as you can see from the experiences that extend over time, the missionaries are not tourists. They don't just go in and take some photos and leave. They stay for years and years and years. Many of them die in China. Many of them spend their lives in China. And over time, Chinese communities began to see missionaries more as friends, as colleagues, as collaborators. But again, not all communities saw that. Uh, certain political groups, of course, would see missionaries as the enemy or as disruptors of culture. So it depends on who you ask and who they were. But it's certainly these images, they capture multiple sides of those nuances. Lei. So my question is sort of related, but specifically about how the Chinese Christians related to camera, which is was at that time really an instrument of modernity as well. So because I growing up, we have got stories about Chinese Christians or Chinese in general would think taking a picture is like snapping the spirit away, right? They have this suspicion. So that's that's how did they did you come across any stories about that? And related to that, that is um, your, your title is developing missions. How, I mean, uh, we only saw the images being transmitted back to the United States and printed in this English magazines, but how, how were the photographs used in the field as part of this you know, missionary's effort to develop the mission to, you know, for their work? These are excellent questions. So the first question about soul stealing. Um, there was a sense by the 1920s and 30s, at least from the people that I looked at, that even Chinese communities saw that as a laughable superstition. And especially if you were a Christian and you were rejecting superstitions, this is not something we believe in. But there's this interesting anecdote that comes out of not just a missionary account, but an account of by W.H. Auden, a uh, British poet, who travels to China in the Second Sino Chinese War. And a beggar on the train platform accosts him and says, you took my photo, you've you stolen my soul. But what do all the other Chinese people around them start doing? He start laughing. He said, that's ridiculous. There's no way you've been stolen your soul. You're not modern, but things like that. So in a way, this Chinese community was already thinking that that's an old stereotype. Let's move beyond that. Um, and your second question about what happens to missionary images on the ground in China. Well, certainly they're republished in Chinese Christian magazines. They're distributed to different churches and hospitals and institutions. Um, but I did find examples of, of the passionists in Hunan who, when they baptized groups of people, would also spend all day taking their photos and all day developing them. Why? Because they could give everyone a copy of their own photo before they went home, almost like a baptismal certificate, but in photographic form that we now belong to your community and you belong to our community. So part of conversion experience. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Lena. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so thanks uh, so much, Joseph, for really uh, an amazing talk, one of the best that I've heard um, in a very long time. So I have a question, and I want to um, preface it by saying that I'm asking this in good faith, and I also kind of have an answer to it <laughs> formulated in my mind already, but I wanted to know how you would answer it. So say I'm a China-centered historian. I don't care about missionaries. I don't really even care about Chinese elites. I'm interested in the peasantry. I'm interested in the countryside. I'm interested in all of these sorts of things. Why should I take a look at this book and devote you know, time to, to reading through it? That's a great question. And I'm curious about your answer too. <laughs> uh, so it's usually, it's usually. It's um, I would say it's a bit of reading against the grain, because in many cases we don't have images of these rural communities outside of missionaries who then spent long periods of time in those places. And I, I showed earlier that still frame of uh, a women's group in the rural North China producing community praying. Um, but the Henkies were essentially, and other missionaries as well, ethnographers, whether they intended it or not, they were bringing cameras to places where cameras had not been. So if you're interested in non-elite activities in rural communities, these are people who spent many, many years in exactly those places. And those images bear out that kind of on the ground embeddedness. And they just run the gamut from different kinds of diverse ways of seeing, participating, and also how people look back 
and one frame didn't get to show was when the Hankies are filming a market scene, one of these rural peasant men in the foreground starts doing this. He's copying them. He's filming them back using an imaginary camera. I'm not sure who they caught it in the footage, but it's amazing to see. And there's that reading against the grain that shows us something else. Anything on the internet? Uh, yeah, there is a question from anonymous attendee that asks, I'm fascinated by your portrayal of missionaries as the first globalists and bridges of cultural and societal knowledge, even introducing technical knowledge with cameras being used. What made missionaries distinctive as nodes of knowledge transmission that is different from other knowledge or different departments? Excellent. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're fully distinctive. They overlap certainly with diplomats and business people. But unlike diplomats and business people per se, or travelers, one, missionaries are there for a long period of time. Two, they're attempting or they try to in this alpha time succeed in becoming fluent in that language and in making those images. They're not the only globalists, they're not the only transmitters of knowledge, but they are participating in a world in which those different kinds of global imaginations and visual practices are already there and they do it in longer periods of time. They also do it because of religious background, because of their faith and faith-based practices. And that of course adds different kinds of angles or nuances uh, or critical issues, problematic issues, depending on how you want to see it. But that is kind of boiled down to them participating in this world, using the technologies of their time and bridging different worlds because it is their job and their calling to do so. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, Dr. Ho, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm from China myself, so I'm a Jew Shen or Shen Jew in Chinese. In fact, uh, Dr. Lei just recently moderated a session of my film, I'm a filmmaker. So what really struck me about your presentation is this enduring power of images, either still photographs or movie pictures. And um, what I was thinking is that this enduring power of um, imagery um, is manifested today in a different way. You know, in the missionary um, old China, there's a documentarian of history because of their um, uniqueness in their possession and their, um, their position in society, what they do. Nowadays, we're seeing other citizens, you know, like an 18 year old girl can um, video the uh, George Floyd, you know, this is sort of a democratization mm -hmm. of the power to the people, of everyday people, because of we have smartphones, yeah, sure. right? So, so my question to you is like your reflection on on the role of um, imagery in uh, documenting history, and then how that is changing both in the missionary world and in the larger world. Excellent. I think really good questions. Um, one of the things I would say, and this comes out in the first chapter of the book, is I go to one of the mission stations that the Hankies worked at, and the church is still there. It's a courtyard. And I walked through the courtyard, I saw these long display cases full of photographs that were from the Hankies time period, but that were inkjet printer copies that a ch the Chinese church today in that city contacted archives in other places in the world or in the United States and received digital copies of these photographs. They then printed out and displayed in this space where the missionary and the Chinese Christians once lived and worked together. And it, it's connecting to a kind of expanded form of what one would do with Lao Tzu Pian. It's a form of nostalgia, but it's also a form of recovery because many of the images that remained with Chinese families and groups were lost. They were destroyed and sometimes by design, destroyed because they were evidence of collaboration with foreigners in the 1960s and 1950s. That was evidence of a sense, you know, essentially problematic relationships. So those photographs were destroyed. But now there's this recovery of history in taking copies of images from archives and churches and groups in the United States and elsewhere and trying to rebuild one's history using those materials. Um, and then the, the, second, the second part of your question, I want to make sure I, I got that correct. Could you, could you repeat this? Yeah, part? just uh, your reflection about the role of uh, image making yes. 
in uh, our bigger society, both in the context of missionary and also the large uh, larger society. Yeah, and that goes back, I believe, to Professor Moscolino's question earlier about why we should take a look at these images. And in many ways, right, the images that you're seeing on screen and in the book are a result of democratization of imagery at the time itself. That these cameras are the 1930s equivalents of iPhones. They go with you, they move, they're small, and they change the relationship that you have with people in front of the lens. And Chinese elites, Chinese Christians, are also taking up the camera as a way of representing themselves or self-representing in images by looking back at the lens, by doing things that would promote their own identity, like self-supporting churches, hospitals, schools. So in a way, this is the beginning of what would become a larger phenomenon of democratic or locally embedded imagery and driven by technology and driven by the identities of these people involved. We've got a couple of more, Ms. Thomas. Uh, yeah, we have another question from a number of anonymous attendee. Um, in video ethnography, the viewer who records must be careful of his own biases and what he chooses to record and not record and how he frames the subject. After all of your video research, are there intentions and purposes that missionaries carried into their work that created a line or lines of recurring themes or perspectives? Excellent question. So part of the question I believe is framing about what the relationship is between them, the filmmaker and the subject. And if you watch some of the Hanky films, you'll see there are moments where the Hankies realize that their filmmaking has disrupted something. There is a sale going on between a market vendor and the person purchasing goods. And they both see the camera, and they both the market vendor stands up because he doesn't want to be bothered with the sale. And immediately the camera shuts off, cuts, because they realize we've intruded, step back, step back. They're not going to keep filming. They realize this has changed something in a local relationship. We're not going to be disrupted. But the Hankies are not the only filmmakers, right? We also have, uh, again, a case I couldn't talk about today in the fifth chapter of my book, Jesuit filmmakers who go to China. These are not missionaries, they're visitors. They're priests from abroad who are making images in the late 1940s. And there's one priest, uh, Father Hubbard, um, who is a documentary filmmaker in his own right. But he's really good commercial work. He puts product placements in his film he hands a little packet of film to a Chinese orphan and says, hold it up to the camera, because this company is paying for my film. And that's a very different relationship to cutting the camera and stepping back. This is no perform for the camera because we have a commercial relationship. And this is the kind of befuddled image of an orphan going like this, with this packet of film, because this missionary, the Jesuit missionary Hubbard, was having all his film sponsored by the ANSCO Corporation of New York. And they needed proof that he was actually using it in China. And he shows up in ads and cameras. That's a very different relationship. So all sorts of nuances here. Good time for one more. If, Back to uh, time. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So um, you talked a lot. Uh, by the way, your your answer to my previous question basically expressed what I was thinking, but far more eloquently. So <laughs> um, the question that I had was actually about film, right? Because you talked about the cameras. Um, the thing is that at least according to my understanding, film was really difficult to get, um, especially during the late 30s and the 40s. And so I wondered how the scarcity of film influenced people's decision-making about what to photograph and how to take photographs. Excellent. Um, this is reading against the great Hanky films. I noticed that some of the hospital films, the foliage changes in the background. It's one scene with different surgeries, but there's like leaves on the trees, leaves off the tree. There are people dressed in warmer clothing and thinner clothing. The Hankies are saving their precious film to make sure that they get the scenes right and to pick what they want people to see. But another part of it is also in what I was reconstructing. That hospital in Shunda only got power, electrical power, for about three or four hours at night. So when could the Hankies actually show the films? It had to be when the generators turned on in the city power plant. And how did they edit their films? I just had this image of Harold and Jesse May sitting in their living room after they've put Robert and Richard down for bed. Up, oh, power's coming on. Turn on the projector. The projector spools up, and they start looking at the, the screen and chatting with each other quietly by the projector, and they will go and splice that film in that time that they have to view that movie. 
Sir, we'll give you the last word. This is if, it. If I were to go to China today, is there anything left of the missionaries' work? It's everywhere. Churches, communities, institutions, and that is a longer, longer history that I cannot answer in one single sentence, but it is everywhere and yet hidden in plain sight. I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. And uh, with that, we will bring the session to an end. Thank you very much for coming. Those of you who are here live time and those who are online, we appreciate it very much. So until the next time. Thank you. Thank you.